Dear audience, good afternoon, good evening, maybe good morning somewhere. Welcome you all to this webinar organized by the FRS, Foundation for Strategic Research. My name is Im Song Yun, visiting fellow in the FRS, today's moderator. Last March 9th, South Koreans elected Mr. Yun Song Yeol, former prosecutor general, as their president. And he started to lead the government since May 10th. I'd like to just remind, the, remind you that the Republic of Korea has a single presidential term of five years. Therefore, President Yoon will lead the country until May 2027. As far as foreign policy is concerned, South Korea has many focused on its four surrounding neighbors, which are United States, China, Japan, and Russia, not to mention its long-standing North Korean policy for its special relationship with DPRK. And the previous Moon Jae-in administration had engaged in diversifying its diplomatic horizon to Southeastern Asian countries and India through the new Southern policy for the last five years. However, we need to keep in mind that South Korea is the only country in Asia to have signed the three major agreements with the European Union covering politics, economics, and trade and security cooperation. And earlier this month, for the first time, newly elected President Yoon sent a special delegation, president, presidential delegation to Brussels and Paris to show his commitment to boosting relations between two parties. And for the EU, South Korea is considered a key partner in strategies, policies, and projects such as EU Indo-Pacific strategies, global gateway, enhancing EU security cooperation in and with Asia, Horizon Europe, and Cyber Direct. And furthermore, uh, next year will mark the 60th anniversary of diplomatic ties between Korea and EU. So given this context, what can we expect from new South Korean government, Yoon Song Yeol government, to further strengthen Korea-EU cooperation and what might be the priority areas? And how can you forecast the evolution of Korea-EU relations amid rising of multiple international uncertainties such as uh, US-China competition and ongoing Ukrainian war on the European continent? In order to discuss these topics, it is my great pleasure to have three experts connected from South Korea and France. Our guest speaker, Ambassador Kim chang -bom, advisor of Center for Strategic and Cultural Studies based in Seoul, former ambassador of the Republic of Korea to the European Union and to Indonesia. Then we have two discussants, Dr. An byung -ok, professor of international studies in Daegu University in South Korea. And from the EU side, we have Dr. Aung Dong Bung Das, Director of FRS KF Korea program. I'd like to especially thank our two experts connected from South Korea for it is quite late time there. Finally, I inform you that we will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So if you have any questions about the topic, please send them through the chat box. All right. Good evening, Ambassador Kim. Um, at the end of April, about two weeks before President Yoon's inauguration, Korean and European experts in politics, think tank, academia, published a policy proposal report entitled Korea-EU cooperation moving to next level. And you or you are its co-editor. As I briefly mentioned, although South Korea is the only country in Asia that has signed three major agreements with EU, we cannot deny that Korea has traditionally focused most of its diplomatic assets and capacities on North Korea and major powers surrounding it, United States and China in particular. So why do you think it is necessary for this Yun Korean Yun government to make more efforts to take the existing cooperation between Korea and EU to the next level? In addition, could you tell us in which areas you think two parties need to focus specifically to that end. Ambassador Kim, now you have the floor for 10 minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mushu Lim is uh, uh, my good friend. Uh, I think it's good to see you uh, on the screen in Paris. 
Uh, I'm very delighted uh, to join uh, this webinar. Uh, many thanks to uh, FRS uh, for organizing uh, this webinar on very timely topic and inviting me uh, to speak as, uh, as, as a guest speaker. I'm, I'm also very honored uh, and happy to be uh, a part of the team together with uh, uh, Dr. Anton, uh, Antoine uh, Bondas from FRS, also uh, another my good friend, uh, Professor An Young Ok uh, from uh, Daegu University. Uh, well, this, uh, uh, as I said, I think this is very timely since uh, it was uh, mentioned by uh, Mr. Lim Sung Jin, uh, the moderator. Uh, it is uh, about uh, a little more than a month after uh, President Yoon Sung Yal of the Republic of Korea, a new president, uh, took his office uh, uh, in Seoul. And we all uh, know that uh, in this pandemic era, with uh, geostrategic risks on the rise and with rule-based order on the sharp challenge, building closer partnership will benefit both the European Union and South Korea. As was uh, well explained by uh, Mr. Lim, uh, Lim Jong Gun, South Korea and the European Union are key strategic partners sharing values, interests, and goals. In fact, South Korea is the only country in Asia that has the three key fundamental agreements covering politics, economics, and security cooperation. More specifically, uh, strategic partnership agreement on the political dimension and EU-Korea free trade agreement, and the third one is a framework participation agreement in crisis management. Uh, this underscores the very importance that the European Union and South Korea attach to each other. This has been enhanced with the uh, release of the European Union's Indo-Pacific strategy in September last year, and more recently, the inauguration of the new government in Korea. Uh, I think the EU is looking at South Korea, perhaps together with Japan, as its most valued partner in Asia and the Indo-Pacific. Likewise, South Korea is looking at the European Union as the most reliable, like-minded partner, sharing common values, democracy, human rights, rule-based order, and market economy. Having said that, under the current challenges that we are now faced with, I think there is no time for complacency. South Korea and the European Union should do more to strengthen bilateral cooperation, especially in the middle of increasing strategic risks and economic uncertainties. The time has come to move relations to the next level. The integration of the new Korean president offers the opportunity to build on the successes of previous administration. That's why uh, I myself, together with other experts, decided to uh, launch a project uh, to put together actionable policy recommendations for the future of cooperation between the European Union and South Korea. That was released uh, in April, that was uh, well explained. Thank you. Uh, this is the, uh, the report. Uh, thank you for uh, warm compliments uh, that you have uh, given to this report. And I think this, uh, I could briefly mention the kind of geopolitical kind of the clouds that uh, we are now living under. Both the European Union and South Korea are concerned about intensifying US-China competition, as well as China's assertive advances in the region and beyond. In this context, it is imperative for the European Union and South Korea to cooperate to promote their prosperity, security, and stability. This has only been accentuated by the recent uh, 
uh, development, including Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And against this backdrop, deeper cooperation with Brussels to help diversify Seoul's external relations, foreign policy directions. It might support South Korea's position as an important player in global affairs. For Brussels, stronger ties with Seoul would help to strengthen its position in the Indo-Pacific. And it might provide support to European Union's role as an economic and normative power in the region, and that those kind of the uh, reinforcing uh, calculation on, on both European Union and South Korea might make both sides work closely together for the next five years. Uh, the report uh, was released uh, in April and right before President Yoon took his office, and it aims at initiating a positive reflection process within the new Korean government and also within the EU institutions to boost bilateral political, economic, and security cooperation. We have presented this uh, copy of the report to the uh, transition team of uh, President Yoon Sung Yeol's uh, 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 and also uh, presented uh, it to the head, uh, head of the delegations and also the uh, European uh, missions based in South Korea. The report is focused on four uh, key uh, areas. The first one is uh, on green strategic partnership that includes uh, green growth, green tech, and sustainable supply chains, uh, and perhaps cooperation in uh, climate actions as well. The second uh, pillar is the digital cooperation that includes uh, resilience against cyber threats, rule and standard uh, setting, and next generation uh, networks. And the third one is bilateral uh, FTA modernizations. Uh, EU Korea uh, FTA has been in place for uh, almost now 11 years, so it does uh, require uh, updates and modernization. Uh, of course, that includes uh, digital trade. Digital service uh, area has not been covered by the uh, that, uh, current EU Korea FTA. The fourth and last one is uh, facing together geopolitical challenges from US-China competition in the context of Beijing's assertiveness. Uh, that is uh, uh, the very uh, much geostrategic kind of realignment uh, of policies uh, between the European Union and uh, South Korea. Also, it includes the uh, support for normalization of inter-Korean dialogue and also support for denuclearization of North Korea. And uh, in conclusion, the EU and South Korea should not simply react to external developments, but rather anticipate and try to shape them together. Uh, that is the kind of essence of the whole uh, gist of the spirits uh, uh, of the report. Uh, considering their shared values strong capabilities and clear political will to strengthen bilateral partnership. The time has come for the two, uh, both the European Union and South Korea, to move their cooperation to the next level. Uh, I think this, uh, uh, this uh, all uh, these discussions uh, that we'll be conducting this uh, afternoon in Paris time, I think will be uh, another uh, good addition to uh, inputs uh, to be uh, digested by uh, policy makers both in Seoul, uh, Brussels, and also in Paris. Thank you. And then uh, I'll be uh, uh, receiving some uh, questions uh, and comments uh, later on uh, as, uh, as, as the moderator will uh, conduct. Right, Ambassador Kim, thank you for your uh, clarification. Well, let me continue our discussion by asking you this question. Um, Indeed, there is a clear understanding of this of for further cooperation as you as you've just mentioned. But mm -hmm. despite all the strong political will of the UN government, is essential to promote and um, implement it effectively. However, although as of today, less than sixty days have passed, 
the current government's interest and diplomatic direction seems to be focused mainly on recovering and upgrading the ROK uh, US alliance. For example, the first uh, foreign leader, President Yoon, met with after taking office was President Biden in May in Korea, and they agreed to upgrade the ROK US bilateral uh, relations to a global comprehensive strategic alliance. At the same time, most of President Yoon's um, diplomatic and security staff, for example, uh, foreign minister, two vice minister, national security um, advisor, director of international, uh, director of national intelligence service, and so on, are so-called Washington-oriented or Washington-friendly figures, um, giving the impression that the interest in the EU is not a priority. Uh, in the absence of interest on the part of VIP or high level officers, Korea EU uh, relations could remain at the level of existing relations. Likewise, the Korea EU summit could remain just an annual event, no matter how many times it is held. So I think, as a former Korea diplomat with 38 years service, you know this situation better than anyone. So, Ambassador Kim, uh, what could be possible solutions or suggestions that led South Korean new government to take more interest in the EU during its five years term? Otherwise, do you think this remain, will remain a limiting point for moving to the next level of Korea-EU cooperation? And finally, I'd like to ask you your comprehensive perspective of uh, Korea-EU relations under South Korea's new government. Ambassador Kim, uh, the floor is yours for... Well, uh, once again, thank you. Uh, well, clearly this, uh, there are limitations and uh, constraints uh, and perhaps some uh, challenges uh, to uh, uh, our future course of actions, especially uh, when it comes to the partnership with the European Union. In, in fact, this uh, European Union itself is quite uh, uh, in a difficult position because uh, it's uh, uh, partly distracted by the ongoing uh, crisis in Ukraine, politically and security-wise. And also, uh, this uh, European Union is also dealing with uh, uh, quite uh, difficult uh, choices in uh, economic and financial uh, areas as well. As uh, likewise, uh, South Korea uh, is in more or less uh, similar situation. So. Uh, of course, the uh, general environment is not in perfect shape for uh, the future uh, strengthening up of uh, bilateral uh, and multilateral cooperation between the European Union and Korea. But I, I think this, and also it is too early to tell, too early to forecast the general direction of uh, EU-Korea partnership under the new Korean presidency. However, uh, I have a bit of uh, different uh, views, uh, uh, even though there are some challenges and uh, kind of, uh, undermining uh, elements uh, uh, when it comes to EU-Korea partnership, but there are uh, some signals that might lead us to have, more relatively speaking, optimistic views on the future. Uh, I can say that it is not a milestone, but it is at least some signals or the uh, points that we could uh, draw some uh, positive uh, uh, elements uh, out of. The first uh, signal is President Yoon sang yeols uh, foreign policy vision uh, during the uh, presidential campaign and also after uh, he took his office. In his contribution titled, South Korea needs to step up that appeared uh, uh, in, on Foreign Affairs uh, uh, magazine, uh, 2022, uh, this year's February issue. He spelled out his foreign policy vision, and he called for clarity and boldness, and for a commitment to values and principle. He emphasized uh, South Korea should no longer be confined to the Korean Peninsula, but rise to the global challenges, it's still uh, a bit unclear, but I think that his vision is well characterized by the pursuit of so-called global pivotal state. Global pivotal state, according to uh, him, is to advance freedom, peace, 
and prosperity through liberal democratic values and substantial cooperation with like-minded partners and alliance builder. So I think it's these principles uh, are already uh, kind of the, uh, announced by President Yoon as his uh, vision for foreign policy is offering renewed opportunities for stronger partnership with the European Union in view of their shared values and commitment to the rule-based order. Another signal that is, uh, as was mentioned by the moderator, President Yoon has uh, dispatched his special envoy to the European Union and France. Uh, France is the uh, current uh, rotating presidency of the European Union uh, uh, after he took his office. Uh, President Yoon's uh, special envoy uh, to the European Union visited uh, Brussels, Strasbourg, and Paris from June 6th to June 11th, so about two weeks ago. And uh, they met with uh, different leaders on, uh, of the EU institutions and NATO, as well as uh, meetings with uh, uh, the uh, current uh, uh, French government. I think this the visit by uh, this uh, special envoy uh, to Brussels and other uh, European cities is significant in that President Yoon is the second consecutive South Korean president to send a special envoy after his inauguration, uh, right at uh, the, the first one was President Moon Jae-in, and then uh, it was uh, followed up by President Yoon. In fact, there were some uh, questions and uh, nervousness uh, in Seoul and also in Brussels about whether this would be a one-off event. But so somehow this uh, it was uh, followed up uh, by uh, President Yoon uh, to send uh, his uh, special envoy that was reassuring to the European Union and it underscores the strengthening of bilateral relations, continued the strengthening up of bilateral relations between Seoul and Brussels in the years to come. The last signal, the third signal is related with President Yoon's attendance at this week's Madrid NATO summit that will be uh, scheduled to uh, uh, take place uh, on June uh, 29th and 30th uh, this week. And of course, South Korea is not a member of the uh, uh, NATO, but has been invited as a partner nation, partner country, along with Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. President Yoon will be the first South Korean president to attend a NATO summit. His attendance at the NATO summit will achieve, hopefully, to strengthen so-called value alliance uh, based on liberal democracy with 30 uh, NATO member states, mostly European countries and partner countries. It might also aim to uh, build a foundation for a comprehensive security network uh, with uh, NATO states and explore ways to effectively respond to emerging security threats, such as cyber and aerospace threats. Uh, I think this is a bit of uh, uh, environment or context in which we could uh, uh, find some new rooms for strategic alignment for the EU and South Korea to work on in a broader context. And uh, so that those are the uh, elements that might be uh, a bit uh, uh, give us uh, some differing uh, projection of the course of action that will be unfolding uh, between the uh, European Union and South Korea. And uh, when it comes to priority areas uh, for future cooperation between European Union and South Korea, I think there are three uh, key areas uh, may emerge. Uh, the first area would be climate change and green growth. And the uh, uh, second is uh, supply chain resilience and digital partnership. And uh, the last one is security on the Korean Peninsula and beyond. So those are the elements uh, might be a bit overlapped with uh, what uh, we have. The report has uh, suggested and uh, recommended uh, for the incoming uh, government in Korea 
uh, as uh, actionable policy suggestions. Uh, so I think that uh, the special envoy dispatched by uh, President Yoon uh, just two weeks ago has uh, already made some initial kind of the exchange of ideas with the uh, European Union's uh, leadership. With regard to uh, climate change and green growth, uh, South Korea and the European Union uh, share a uh, strong commitment to become carbon neutral by 2050. Cooperation in joint research, technology sharing, uh, or expertise and know-how exchange would help both uh, EU and South Korea to try to fulfill their pledge by 2050. And uh, when it comes to uh, the resilience of uh, supply chain, I think the particularly EU is uh, interested in tapping into South Korean expertise, uh, technologies, and investment in areas such as next generation semiconductors, uh, 6G, sixth generation, and uh, green shipping, green technologies, electric batteries, and the digital uh, technologies, among others. And uh, another area is security cooperation. Of course, this should involve both bilateral uh, South Korea EU cooperation, uh, as well as collaboration between South Korea and specific EU member states, including uh, France, Germany, Italy, and, and, uh, and others. Uh, dealing with North Korea would be uh, on the top of the uh, priority agendas, but uh, another issue is how to deal with uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, just uh, to uh, share with you, if the South Korea is one of the only two Asian nations imposing sanctions on Moscow, and uh, transferring non lethal military uh, assistance to Ukraine along with Japan. So uh, those are the uh, kind of uh, uh, areas uh, for uh, further uh, cooperation between European and uh, South Korea. Uh, but of course, the, uh, as was mentioned by the moderator, uh, there are some hiccups and uh, kind of setbacks uh when uh both sides will be meeting and faced with the uh difficult uh, choices and challenges uh, on the road in conclusion uh, even though there must be some challenges and limitations i believe uh, some uh, optimisms about the future of eu korea partnership in the next coming years all right thank you ambassador kim for sharing your positive signals. <laughs> <laughs> so without delay, based on the ambassador's remark, uh, we would like to hear from our two discussants, their overviews or reaction on the perspectives of Korea-EU cooperation. So Professor An speaks first, then Antoine continues. You have five minutes each. So Professor An, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I'm very pleased to see Ambassador Kim and Dr. Antoine and also Song Gyun. Actually, he was an excellent student of mine when I was teaching at the graduate school. <laughs> Time flies, okay. So, uh, concerning the report that Ambassador and his colleagues presented both to the Transition Committee and the EU Ambo in Seoul, I do agree with the recommendations. But from my point of view, what matters is the political will of the new Korean government. And unlike the optimist, optimistic assessment by Ambassador Kim, I am a little bit not so positive so far. I mean, let's compare the uh, time period between the previous month government and current Yun administration. For four or five days after President, former President Moon was sworn in, he appointed six special envoys, that is, four big powers around the Korean Peninsula and ASEAN, Association of South Asian Nations, and EU. And I and many Korean EU experts were very pleased to see that EU was specifically 
I mean, Korean, new Korean government uh, nominated, I mean, sent special envoys to you. It was the first time that so far I remember, I mean, just so, so soon after the new government came to power. But the new Yun, President Yun dispatched special envoys in about two weeks ago. Yes, I am six weeks ago. Uh, senior National Assembly man Kim, but uh, nearly three weeks after he was sworn in. So we can see the big difference between the previous government and current one. So uh, what? So uh, with this aspect, I mean, uh, the matter of political will. So far, the early signs are, are not so positive. That's my first impression or conclusion. And another part of the proposal, I mean, EU Korea Council or Korea EU Council, I think that would be the uh, best one if it's uh, uh, implemented uh, in future. But that also needs a very strong commitment from both sides. Yes, I mean, we say you need to, or it takes two to tango, right? So I think it's a very good proposal. Also, uh, Ambassador Kim and colleagues proposed you the special representative for North Korea. Uh, that's a very splendid recommendation, but uh, it also needs very strong, very strong commitment from both sides. So, uh, but so far, the Yun administration, the new administration, continues and will continue to remain uh, focused on its relations, first of all, most of all, with the United States and also Japan. I mean, uh, China still not talking to each other so far. So, uh, and that's the Kim. Uh, pointed out that President Yoon is coming, is attending NATO summit scheduled on 29th, 30th June, Madrid. Yeah, that's the first time. That's a very positive signal. But the Chinese government continued to criticize, I mean, label harsh criticism against such a diplomatic action. That clearly shows that China is very, China demands very irritated at the new administration's U.S. first China, I mean, U.S. first policy. So that's my uh, main conclusions, okay? Yeah, my time is up, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Sung Hyun for organizing and inviting uh, the three of us and especially a uh, big thanks to Ambassador Kim. Uh, I will try to be very brief and, and end with uh, some question actually to Ambassador Kim. The, the first one and, and thanks partly to Ambassador Kim, we've achieved a lot over the last uh, 10 years between Europe and Korea. We've signed a lot of agreements. Uh, there is uh, a lot of cooperation ongoing, etc. Uh, and yet, when most of European leaders think of Asia, think of the Indo Pacific, they will think of Japan, of India, of course, of China first, but maybe not to Korea first. And, and that's kind of a problem we have, you know, when you organize uh, foreign visits of president, foreign affairs ministers, etc. Korea is never considered by most European countries are the top priority. And, and one of the question is, how do we change it? How do we make sure that when we talk about digital, when we call, talk about uh, energy transition, and you mentioned it, when we talk about uh, shipping, of course, and shipyards, etc., Korea is a top priority, and we have more high-level Europeans visiting Korea and vice versa. Because even though... Uh, President Yoon is coming to Europe in, in a few days to Madrid. And even though he will stay in Madrid for a visit to Spain, he's not going to go to Brussels. He's not going to visit any other country, or at least it's not being announced yet. And that's, of course, unfortunate 
that um, is coming to Europe, but he doesn't have time, I would say, to either go to the EU in Brussels or maybe to visit Germany or France. And I hope, of course, that he will have plenty of side events, side meeting and bilateral meetings with head of government and head of state in, in Madrid, uh, with, of course, France, Germany, but other, also, of course, the other uh, country. Because once again, that's a great opportunity so early I would say in a five years mandate for the president to visit uh, Europe. And I hope that this key opportunity uh, won't be wasted. It, will won't, it won't be only on NATO. It won't be only about organizing a meeting between the Korean president and the Japanese prime minister. Let's see if it's happened, but that there is kind of some substance with, with the Europeans. And I also perfectly agree with you that there is a lot of issues in which we can cooperate. One big issue, is of course economic security and by economic security i think we can talk about something broad about the resilience of supply chains about how to fight uh, economic corrosion i mean korea has been sanctioned by china in 2016 2017 after uh, deploying the thad or accepting the us to deploy the thad lithuania and some european companies has been sanctioned by china uh, last year etc so that's something to be discussed. And I think that question of economic security is on the top of the agenda in Korea. Uh, the Blue House, even though we should not, maybe not call the presidential <laughs> office this way anymore, uh, but let's say that the presidential office is um, appointed uh, an economic security advisor. Uh, and, and I think that's a huge potential for discussion and for cooperation between Europe and Korea in a time which Europe is a very strong economic partner to Korea, but in which we could do much more between Korea and Europe because trade remains kind of limited if we compare it, of course, with the trade with, um, the, uh, the, with, with China. But even if we compare the EU trade with Korea, with the tra Korea trade with, uh, with Vietnam that is booming over the last few years. So I think economic security is a, is a major uh, issue. And just to conclude, and I would like to have your view because you've been ambassador in EU than in Indonesia in the heart of the Indo-Pacific in a way. Um, how do you see the potential of cooperation between Europe and Korea in the Indo-Pacific in which we share, I would say, kind of the same objective, European and Koreans. Uh, we don't want to be trapped into the Sino-US rivalry. Uh, we don't want to be confrontational to China. Uh, we are not security and military providers, even though we might export weapons, but we're not security providers in, in the traditional sense. We want to have kind of a strategic autonomy. Uh, we are not part of AUKUS, and we do not intend to be part of it. So how do you see the potential of cooperation between two entities, EU and EU member state and Korea, in which we have so much and so many convergences in the Indo-Pacific. And if we started cooperation in third country, in Indo-Pacific countries, what kind of cooperation could it be? Should it be ODA in terms of uh, energy transition? Should it be a uh, focus on maritime affairs and non-traditional security, etc.? So to have maybe your, your view of an experienced diplomat in both the heart of Europe and the heart of the ASEAN and the Indo-Pacific. All right, thank you, uh, Antoine. And it was not only comments, but also lots of questions uh, raised to Ambassador Kim. So I think it's better now I give the floor to Ambassador Kim to answer. Uh, thank Kim. you. I, as, uh, thank you both, uh, Professor An, also uh, Antoine. Well, this, uh, the, first of all, this, uh, let me uh, touch on uh, points raised by uh, Professor An, uh, his uh, points was quite uh, legitimate. I think that's uh, uh, the in comparison with the uh, previous uh, government, especially uh, President Moon Jae-in's uh, initially strong uh, commitment to uh, expanding uh, outreaches with the uh, European Union and other uh, parts of the world, especially uh, Southeast Asia, ASEAN and India. Uh, uh, the intensity, uh, level of intensity uh, uh, we are now witnessing uh, from President Yoon has, and also his foreign policy team is a bit weaker uh, as, as far as uh, uh, we are now uh, seeing uh, for the last about six, uh, 60 days uh, after the inauguration. Uh, but I think that's uh, the uh, 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 we'll have to see uh, uh, what uh, what kind of actions they will uh, try to translate uh, 
from their uh, rhetorics and words. Uh, it's too early to tell, but I think there's uh, uh, one uh, uh, another positive signal that uh, we get uh, we couldn't go is that uh, because this uh, of course this uh, uh, the uh, new administration is uh, very much uh, tilting toward uh, deeper and stronger uh, upgraded alliance uh, with the United States and also try to uh, mend uh, bilateral ties with Japan. But at the same time, this uh, this uh, general kind of the direction or the value based uh, orientation put forth by uh, President Yoon and his team uh, on uh, liberal democracy, a rule based order and uh, democracy and human rights. I think that those are the things that could be only be uh, achievable uh, through multilateral and bilateral cooperation with the European Union without uh, that. Uh, stronger collaboration with the European Union. I think this, uh, this uh, general uh, goal uh, put forth by the new government in Korea may not be uh, well uh, attained. So I think this, uh, uh, the, uh, the team in, uh, at the new office of the prison in Seoul uh, will, uh, and hope, uh, I hope that uh, they will uh, be uh, fully aware of this, uh, the sharp needs uh, uh, on, on their, uh, their desk. And uh, I think that's uh, is also quite uh, legitimate for Dr. Ahn to point out uh, kind of the uh, uh, possible backlash or the uh, uh, kind of uh, repercussions uh, from uh, the new Korean government's uh, inclination to uh, uh, lopsided inclination, uh, uh, so-called, uh, toward the United States uh, would uh, produce uh, when it comes to uh, uh, its relations with China. So I think that uh, uh, it is uh, quite a daunting challenge for the new government in Korea to uh, at least avoid or to reduce possible uh, backlashes or the repercussions uh, from China. Uh, that is uh, not an easy task, but I think there's a uh, 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 policy, uh, foreign policy team in uh, Seoul uh, will uh, perhaps uh, bear in mind what kind of uh, tasks uh, they will have to uh, be up to uh, when it comes to this whole uh, foreign policy uh, conundrum. And about uh, uh, Dr. Antoine's uh, questions, uh, first of all, this uh, uh, let me just uh, touch on uh, the uh, perhaps some uh, possibilities that uh, the new Korean uh, president might have traveled to other parts of uh, European capitals uh, to, uh, in his. Uh, uh, extended uh, lack of journey uh, from his trip to NATO, uh, Spain, Madrid. Uh, I think that's uh, initially uh, what I heard from uh, the uh, National Security Advisors team uh, in Seoul that initially they were thinking of uh, extending uh, uh, his lack of journey to Brussels. But somehow it's uh, uh, because everybody, uh, whether in Paris, whether in uh, uh, Brussels or Germany, they are all tied up with uh, different schedules. Diplomatic, because now it's G7 is on the way in Germany. So uh, nobody is in Brussels. So nobody uh, is available in Brussels. Of course, everybody is now all gathered uh, in, uh, in Madrid. So I think there's, uh, there are some uh, technical and logistical difficulties uh, in order for uh, President Yoon to extend his lack of journey to other parts of uh, European capitals. So I think that's, of course, that I'm, I'm not giving any excuse, but uh, that's kind of the logistical uh, kind of uh, explanation on the part of uh, the uh, team uh, at the Office of President in Seoul, Korea. And uh, I think the economic security, that's uh, clearly on the uh, top of the agenda. Uh, I think in, not only in South Korea, but also in Washington, D.C., in Brussels, in Paris, in, 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 in China as well. I think that's uh, now the commercial and economic uh, interests are not separable from just strategic and strategic uh, interest. 
uh, I think that's why this uh, new uh, uh, government in South Korea has set up a special uh, department within the uh, Office of Ops of the President under National Security Advisors Office. This uh, uh, Secretary uh, for Economic Security is uh, now uh, set in place. So uh, I think there's, uh, those, uh, that area might be uh, another uh, uh, kind of sector that we'll have to uh, develop uh, further uh, under the broader framework of EU-Korea cooperation. That's why I have uh, recommended specifically that uh, EU-Korea uh, Council uh, that is uh, covering both trade, foreign policy, and economic coordination and others uh, as, a, as a whole. So uh, it's more like a, a kind of uh, pretty much uh, resembling uh, the, uh, the EU, uh, US, US EU uh, body uh, called the EU, US uh, Trade and Technology Council. So uh, uh, we, uh, we were thinking that uh, it is quite high time for EU and South Korea to uh, do the same uh, in order to uh, address this issue of economic security. And the uh, last one uh, is uh, quite uh, a broad uh, topic that is uh, how uh, EU and South Korea can work together in uh, coordinating uh, their policies and perhaps doing some actions uh, in, in the Pacific. Uh, at, I think that you have given uh, a number of uh, good exemplary uh, cases or the areas of cooperation. Of course, this uh, uh, it is still uh, evolving. Uh, it, the EU in the Pacific strategy has been uh, uh, out uh, just about uh, uh, less than a year, uh, and the South Korea new government is now uh, drafting its own in the Pacific strategy. Uh, I think that's, uh, I don't know when uh, it will be uh, released, but uh, perhaps uh, this broader uh, regional policy initiative uh, is now being uh, drafted uh, in Seoul that would include uh, its policy outreach uh, with uh, ASEAN and also with uh, uh, India and other uh, regional players uh, in the in the Pacific. Uh, as was mentioned by uh, Antoine uh, quite eloquently, uh, there are four areas uh, that I might uh, envision uh, as, a, as a prelude that first of all is uh, maritime security and how to uh, beef up uh, capacities uh, for the, uh, the countries in the region, especially in view of uh, their stronger uh, uh, needs and a kind of sense of urgency to tackle uh, the, uh, this uh, China's uh, very uh, aggressive uh, advance into the region. And the second is uh, coordination and perhaps some tri seaway trilateral cooperation in, in the field of uh, ODA, official development assistance, uh, how to uh, put together uh, the resources uh, in uh, setting out some uh, very targeted and uh, focused uh, kind of priority uh, uh, economic cooperation with some countries in the in ASEAN and also in uh, South Asia. And the third one is, I think, this energy transition that was uh, also mentioned by Antoine, is that uh, the, uh, every country in the, uh, in, the, in the Pacific is very much committed to uh, fulfill their pledge uh, to become uh, carbon neutral uh, by some specific year, some uh, by 2050 sometime, some uh, by 2060, and so uh, how to uh, help uh, assist those countries in need uh, to have a smooth and uh, cleaner uh, energy transition uh, that is a common task for both EU and South Korea to work together on. So uh, that is one area. And the last one is, uh, I think there's uh, uh, this uh, bit uh, difficult one, I think there's uh, uh, more strategic dialogue. I think there's uh, uh, not only just a kind of specific and uh, very substantive cooperation, but how to uh, interact with policymakers in the in the in the Pacific together with uh, with the European Union uh, or uh, from the viewpoint of South Korea. So kind of the policy dialogue and strategic consultancies. So those are the areas that uh, we could start at the, at the beginning. So. Uh, uh, without uh, the 
very uh, kind of uh, substantive dialogues and preliminary uh, brainstorming that we may not be uh, able to come up with some good solutions. So I think that's, those are the areas that uh, we could offer. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ambassador, for providing your uh, in-depth uh, explanation. Uh, let me continue our discussion just by asking a question to our two discussants. Um, Dr. An Antoine, North Korea has continued its provocative missile launches including ICBM since the beginning of this year. And many experts believe that the Pyongyang 7th nuclear test is on its way. Yun government's position on North Korea is significantly different from that of previous administration. While promoting dialogue, it clearly states the principle of firm response to DTRK's provocation, specifically nuclear test. Well, even though the EU is taking its own sanction against North Korea, as well as sanctions under the UN Security Council resolution, many experts point out that the EU's role on the Korean Peninsula and solving the North Korean uh, nuclear issue is somewhat limited. In the face of war in Ukraine, as Ambassador said, the EU does not seem to have uh, room to deal with North Korean problem. So do you agree with these opinions or if the EU can still contribute to the peace process on the Korean Peninsula, especially in a situation where the confrontation between Korea, US, Japan block and North Korea, China, Russia block escalates? So how, what does the new Korean government expect from the EU on this matter? So I give the floor first to Mr. Dr. Antoine Mungas. You have five minutes to answer. Yeah. Uh, I'll be brief again. Uh, th there are many things that the EU can do to adapt and improve the so-called strategy of critical engagement. Um, and the current situation is in a way not fundamentally different from the, I mean, from the situation a few years ago. Uh, I, I wrote a paper for CIPRI and the EU Commission, I, I think it was in early 2020, on very practical step and, and concrete policy recommendation on how to improve uh, the EU policy. Uh, so I think in terms of non-proliferation, in terms of uh, implementing sanctions, in terms of engaging North Korea, uh, we can do much more and, and better. Uh, and if I can be very, very brief, I would say that one of the big problems we've had at the EU level over the last few years, especially in 2016, 2017, was the lack of coordination within the EU, to be honest. So I would say it's our own and, and own internal EU problem. We lack coordination sometimes. We lack discussion among the member states that have not opposite, but not aligned views, let's say Sweden and France, not, uh, not to uh, mention any country. Uh, and, and we need to do more. And that's why many years ago, I started to advocate the appointment of an EU special representative for North Korea, or at least for the Korean Peninsula, whose work would be not only to coordinate among the member states, to coordinate within the EU Commission, among the different DGs, and to coordinate, of course, with our partners in the region, uh, the US, China, Japan, even Russia, they all have a special representative for the Korean Peninsula and for North Korea. We do not. So it would make sense. It would make sense all the more since we don't have an ambassador, an EU ambassador to North Korea, etc., even though we have diplomatic relations since 2001. So that's one very practical step. But to have a special representative mean to have, uh, I would say, a renewed strategy or at least a common strategy. And once again, I think there are many things we can do even with the pandemic. And, and something I've been working also for quite a few years, that the possibility for Europeans, be it the EU, but also the member states, to help North Korea, I would say, build up a so-called crisis management mechanism to face natural disasters, but also other disasters could be like a pandemic, etc. And of course, the, the COVID-19 pandemic is, is one key issue. And that's something that the North Korea have been asking for. Uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un has said it publicly, not asking the EU for help, but saying that this is a priority to build this kind of crisis management mechanism. The North Korean diplomats in Europe have asked us to uh, better understand the way we, in our own respective country, but also at the EU level, manage natural disasters and pandemic. So I think that there is two things we can do. First, we could share with North Korea 
the way we work in Europe in terms of uh, uh, crisis prevention, management, preparedness, etc., and maybe in a second step, if it's possible, to help them build this kind of mechanism. Because to be clear, the EU is a strong actor in terms of humanitarian assistance to North Korea. We have before COVID, four, the four resident NGOs in North Korea were all from the EU, two French, one German, one uh, Irish. So that's something very concrete you could do. Because to be honest, and, and we need to be on that very honest and straightforward, on the denuclearization of North Korea, even though we have a role to play within international organization, and that's why the EU has been very active at the first committee of the United Nations General Assembly every year. That's why at the conference on disarmament, we've been active, etc. But we don't have the key to the solution. We don't have the key to the solution. So we can amplify a dynamic. If there is an agreement, we can, of course, uh, contribute to implementing it, but we don't have the key for, for the denuclearization of Korea and we need to be honest. So there are many other stuff in which the EU can do more, should do more. And uh, as Ambassador Kim said, the problem we have today is a problem of priorities. North Korea, to be honest, is no longer on the agenda. Uh, and it might come back on the agenda because of the seventh nuclear test. And honestly, on that, it, it kind of makes me quite angry that we've had few years to coordinate within Europe, uh, among European countries. And as always, we're going to wait for a crisis to start thinking. And that's something I would say is not foresight, is not good policies, and it's not good governance, just to wait for the crisis to start talking about it when we can anticipate it, of course. Thank you, uh, thank you, Antoine, uh, Professor An. Okay. I think Dr. Antoine made a very good point, and I agree with him on most part of it. Um, I know a German NGO working in Seoul, before the pandemic, he continued to visit North Korea and meeting North Korean officials, teaching them some kind of market economy and so on. And his step was very practical. I mean, he uh, was working along the border area, how to preserve the environment uh, in North Korea and so on. And President Yoon's approach to North Korea is it's just like Heaven and us, we say. I mean, he has taken a very confrontational approach for the North Korea. And it seems to me that the new government might be thinking that continued pressure on North Korea might bring North Korea to the negotiating table. But uh, judging from the three decades of experience with North Korea. North Korea mostly chose its own timing and negotiating, I mean, timing and its negotiating posture. That is, continue the pressure for the North Korea have not worked so far effectively, so far. So let's see whether new government approach, I mean, it's just the approach, not not a genuine policy, I think, would work. So in this regard, I think the EU could play a very constructive role. From an, an Europeanist point of view, European integration is first of all about peace project, right? So EU is trying to promote its model of, I mean, experience, peace, how to build up peace, how to overcome the historical antagonism so far. So uh, while continue to imposing sanctions against North Korea, EU should do more, I mean, to critically engage North Korea. Uh, after the nuclear testing, as far as you know, EU or European Parliament stopped meeting North Koreans, right? So uh, I don't know when the European Parliament or EU might resume a dialogue in North Korea, but if or when uh, the EU can resume dialogues with North Korea in proper time, that would send a very strong signal to the Korean, Korean government. That is, Korean government might reconsider its confrontational approach to North Korea. 
That's my point. Okay. Thank you uh, for to sharing your views. Um, Ambassador Kim, do you have any additional comments on uh, Korean Peninsula? Uh, I can give you, because of short of time, just two minutes. Well, uh, I think that's, uh, uh, as far as uh, North Korean issues is concerned, uh, there are a wide range of, a wide spectrum of uh, different voices and different opinions. So I don't, I don't want to uh, dive into uh, uh, substantive discussions on uh, this North Korean issue. I think this, uh, uh, as was uh, mentioned by uh, Antoine and also uh, Dr. Professor An, I think this, uh, uh, as was also included in the report uh, we have uh, uh, published uh, as uh, actionable policy recommendations, I think this EU can uh, nominate and appoint a special representative for the Korean Peninsula, uh, especially uh, in view of the increasing uh, uh, this uh, importance of closer coordination on uh, in policy toward uh, North Korea. And the second thing, I think that uh, uh, this uh, we may uh, uh, expect uh, North Korea to uh, conduct another uh, nuclear test. Uh, it would be uh, no surprise uh, to see uh, that uh, happen uh, anytime soon. I think that's. Uh, that would be another small uh, game changer in all the uh, calculations uh, amongst uh, uh, different players uh, dealing with uh, North Korea, including European Union and South Korea. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ambassador. Um, in fact, time is up, but I would like to just uh, pick up one question from audience in our chat box. So um, from David Gambu, the coup d'etat had led to the end of the democratic transition and superior into a civil war. Do you think, do you see a role of South Korea and the EU as uh, external players jointly playing a role as an uh, honest broker contributing, contributing to ending military rule in Myanmar? Because both South Korea and the EU were providers of aid and FDI uh, during the period of 2011 to 2021. So um, this is open question to all three of you. So uh, if you can answer it, feel free. Well, just, just very briefly, I think this is quite a, a relevant question in view of the, uh, uh, this, a bit of uh, lack of attention now being uh, 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 imposed upon uh, the current uh, uh, situation in Myanmar. I think this, uh, uh, the uh, one quick answer is that uh, there will be a room for uh, forest coordination between the European Union and uh, South Korea, uh, both in the uh, uh, very much focused approach uh, directed uh, toward uh, Myanmar. And another one is that uh, within the, a bit uh, broader regional context, uh, uh, which is uh, kind of a policy dialogue uh, with ASEAN uh, as a whole. Uh, I think there's uh, the second, uh, the latter uh, point that is uh, EU, South Korea, uh, and uh, ASEAN uh, trilateral policy dialogue. That would be very helpful uh, in at least to uh, enhancing uh, the, uh, the awareness uh, of, of uh, these ASEAN leaders uh, in. Uh, through that uh, kind of the uh, joint uh, conversation with the uh, leadership uh, in ASEAN. And another one is, of course, this, uh, this, uh, uh, the, the, the official development assistance and uh, foreign direct investment things. That those are that already uh, on hold, uh, as far as I know, uh, from a South Korean uh, viewpoint. But I think there's, uh, uh, since this whole situation will be uh, continuing uh, on. And so I think that uh, there will be a, a more policy consultation uh, in need uh, between the European Union and South Korea. Thank you, Ambassador. Anyone want to add it? Right. 
So in time has switched up, I have to wrap up the session. Uh, today we have discussed the Korea EU cooperation under the new Korean government from different angles. Uh, we could confirm that um, there are potentials and constructive uh, signals, but also some limits. We hope that this webinar was meaningful for your understanding of Korea EU relations. Um, I thank our three uh, experts, Ambassador Kim, and Dr. Lan, Dr. Bondas, I think I thank the whole audience for your participation. Thank you. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you, Ambassador Kim. Next time it will be in Paris in person. Thank you, in person. Okay. Thank you, thank you uh, Professor An. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.